thank you, Paulus, for the introduction, for a very witty introduction and uh, for every nice word. I'm delighted to have been able to work with you, both Jurgita and Paulus and uh, the whole team. All of you uh, used to be young students and now you are uh, the specialist of, interna of the international class, premium class specialists. I'm so delighted that uh, such specialists work and uh, organize such events like this. I've uh, just been listening to Shibon and uh, I, am, I was so amazed that a high level specialist as Shibon speaks about how uh, traumatic uh, and stressful life events can affect a person's uh, well-being and suicidal behavior. And uh, we, in the context of suicidology, we may be delighted about that because in the current suicidolo suicidology, it is not common sense that uh, Suicidal behavior has anything in common with life and reality. Normally, only the medical model is applicable where we can find such data in some work that 90% of suicide, uh, suicidal people, uh, um, those who committed suicide, had just mental diseases and that's it. And uh, such uh, discussions and the works uh, presented by Shibon uh, show that this is part and parcel of one's life and uh, uh, you cannot uh, uh, separate that uh, from um, your experience. And uh, I will continue uh, her thoughts and I will present my own data. These are the indicators of suicide rates in Lithuania since we started officially measuring, reg registering them. Uh, the fourth, uh, the third decade, and uh, uh, when you consider the uh, graph more carefully, uh, we feel like being in a drama. There's something very dramatic about it. What is the drama about? And the suicidology classics have already explained that drama. Durheim and his students have always been confirming that suicide rates in the society are related to societal perturbations, troubles, when the normal balance in the society gets disturbed, then people feel less safe and su the suicide rate increases. Durheim and uh, his uh, students, especially Maurice Halbox, Hall uh, introduced uh, the term social thermometer, moral thermometer, the temper temperature social thermometer. And he says that the number of suicides can be considered a sort of them thermometric indicator, which informs us of the condition of the mores, of the moral uh, temperature of a group. This is the authentic uh, uh, quote. Uh, this uh, thermometer informs us about uh, the period and the moral temperature of the group or the society. We have to remember this idea in Lithuania all the time. It helps us understand things because the time within which we had various troubles has been very long was very long. We will start with three occupations. The first Soviet occupation happened in 1940, and the, story, the history went as follows, as we know. In the uh, in mid uh, 20th century, we had two criminal regimes, the communism and fascism, Hitler and Stalin, who were dividing Europe between themselves. First, they had agreed, then, on the 1st of September 1939, uh, Germany um, 
invaded Poland and on the 28th of September when the war started, uh, Germany and the Soviet Union signed the cooperation agreement and the secret protocols. And uh, uh, based on them, they uh, divide uh, the territory. Uh, Lithuania gets in the domain of the Soviet Union. And that's why in 1940, uh, the Soviet army uh, enters, invades Lithuania and occupies us. But uh, very quickly, both criminals uh, start uh, disputing and start a war in 1941. And the Nazi army pushes out uh, the Soviet army from Lithuania. And then we experience the Nazi occupation from 1941 to 1944 with everything, with the Holocaust, uh, with the prosecution of disobedient, the disobedient ones. And in 1944, the Red Army comes back and Lithuania gets occupied by the Soviets once again. During the second uh, occupation, we had a long-armed uh, um, Um, resistance, here, um, resistance movement, and uh, many uh, people uh, left for woods uh, in order to to um, protect their families and uh, um, well, it uh, lasted for another ten years. By uh, 1953, Lithuania lost a third of its uh, population who either experienced political repressions or emigrated. And uh, those people who were able, uh, they left for the West. Uh, we lost 1.2 million people in Lithuania. And uh, for 50 years, uh, up until 1990, Lithuania lived in the Soviet occupation. Uh, Polish Grubis drew, uh, uh, drew this uh, beautiful um, graph. And I really liked it because it was shown in one of the previous conferences and um, I asked Paulus to let me use it. Uh, Paulus um, noted uh, the impacts, uh, so uh, social negative and positive impacts, which you, uh, can be uh, seen at every uh, breakthrough uh, or every breakthrough of the social disbalance. Uh, in at these points when there was that uh, breakthrough in terms of suicidal rate, uh, we can notice the following uh, phenomena. Uh, this is the pre-war Lithuania, which was an independent uh, interwar European country, and uh, the suicidal rate was very low, um, the uh, 8.1 uh, per 1,000 people on average, and uh, the uh, distribution of uh, males and uh, females uh, was uh, more or less the same as everywhere else. Uh, the rate was double as high as that uh, for males uh, than for women, and uh, Lithuania was a Catholic country and had a very low uh, suicide rate, just like uh, Poland. And this was noted that the Catholic communities and countries have a lower um, suicide rate than the Protestant uh, communities. And uh, then the hypothesis was uh, uh, formed that Catholicism is a higher and um, uh, safeguard um, from suicides. And uh, some uh, deny this, but this hypothesis, this idea is uh, uh, still uh, alive. 
And uh, now if we take the period from the first uh, occupation till uh, 58, but actually it was still 1962, and there's no specific uh, statistics on the uh, prevalence of uh, uh, suicides. Uh, neither uh, during uh, the first Soviet occupation or the second Nazi or, or the Nazi occupation or the second Soviet occupation, we do not have the suicide rate indicators. We only know from our historical documents that at the beginning of the second occupation in Lithuania, we used to have uh, so many resistance suicides, thousands of Lithuanian. Um, resistance movement participants would blow themselves in order uh, would would explode themselves in order to avoid arrests uh, or tortures they uh, would uh, declare that they had better die than give in and they would uh, They would explode themselves so that uh, uh, their uh, loved ones are not tortured. And um, uh, the, those resistance movement participants used to be um, Christians and uh, it was very difficult to compare their heroic um, uh, behavior uh, and uh, their uh, Christian beliefs, but uh, the idea of, of heroic suicide becomes deep-rooted in the collective memory, and during decisive historical times, for instance, the independence movement, the idea of a heroic suicide uh, become would become revived. Uh, the uh, people re remembered how our resistance movement participants would rather die than give in. As of 1959, we started getting statistical data. Uh, during the whole Soviet occupation period, the number of su the suicide rate was increasing, and uh, it has increased by ten times since uh, that moment, especially in the rural area. These are urban and rural indicators, and we see the number of suicides increasing in rural areas very much. And uh, the uh, suicide rate between men and women is uh, becoming, um, uh, well, the difference is becoming higher and higher. In 1972, there was a political protest a suicide committed by uh, a student, a, a school ch a school student, Romas Kalant Kalanta, uh, who burned himself in the protest of Soviet occupation. We were never. Uh, we, we never knew about those uh, indicators because the idea was secret, because the idea was that uh, there are no evil things in a country of mature socialism. And therefore, if there are any work accidents at work or uh, suicides or um, political unrests, uh, there was no data about that. And scientists would not get that data. And uh, the only reason why we can speak about that whatsoever was that after the restoration of independence, it, it turned out that the data was very strictly registered, but it was hidden. That's why we can rely on the data, because it, because it is reliable. Well, we lived in that atmosphere and tension and alcohol became very widespread in order to uh, combat psychosocial stress. And uh, the alcohol abuse problem became more and more acute.
what was happening in rural areas and uh, what were the factors that uh, um, impacted people and led them to suicide. So in uh, Lithuania, which was an agricultural company uh, country, um, people uh, saw their holdings taken away. They were draw driven to the collective farms. Uh, large farmers were deported to Russia. Um, community life was completely destroyed. Um, organizations, uh, parishes were disintegrated and uh, uh, it seemed uh, to people that the only way out or the only coping strategy was alcohol abuse. Well, the historians who uh, were looking at uh, some diaries from those times, uh, they said that if you look at one case, you can see the entire period and what was characteristic of that period. So I'll give you one example. Uh, the father of uh, this person was uh, a poor uh, farmer with a small plot of land. Uh, his uh, greatest wish was to have his own farm. So he married a woman who was older than him, but who came from a rich family. Uh, so he acquired a large farm. But uh, after the Soviet occupation and collectivization, uh, his farm was confiscated and the family was allowed to stay in only one part of the house and uh, everything else went to the collective farm. And this person's daughter wrote in her memories that uh, after the war, Russians came again, they... Um, uh, took uh, the livestock away uh, after some, uh, so they took the, all the horses away. After some time, they came back with our horses. The horses were uh, starved. Um, uh, the the fa my father um, went up to the horse, uh, hugged the horse, and started crying. The horse also cried. So. Um, the father after that um, started drinking, became violent, and in a few years he hung himself in a shed. So alcohol abuse became a coping strategy. I um, can show you a few other testimonies. Uh, for example, a report from a resistant fighter, resistance fighter, uh, to high authorities um, of uh, resistance. So when it comes to the vices of um, urban population, I have to say that uh, uh, there are many vices, but um, they are determined by uh, the moods and morals of the population. One of the problems is alcohol abuse, uh, which is uh, widely spread among intelligentsia and um, in the entire population. So uncertainty about the future, no, the fact that people see no sense in life or in work, uh, general pessimism about the survival of our uh, nation, uh, this led to um, people uh, trying to forget this bitter reality. Um, another testimony said that uh, if other things don't overcome us, alcohol will. Um, there were more um, actions of political protest, that is political suicides. Uh, they started in the communist bloc in the um, uh, 1960s, and there were numerous political suicides. For example, uh, Jan Palak in the Czech Republic, uh, uh, Richard Sivich in Poland in 1968, uh, Sandor Bauer, a Hungarian in 1969, 
uh, Oskar Butzewitz passed uh, in the German Democratic Republic 1976, then Rolf Günther in 1978, and then um, in late um, in the late period of uh, the Soviet Union um, Ukrainian in 1987. Well, it is interesting to observe that there are no uh, incidents of self-immolation in the Western world. Um, these phenomena come from Buddhist and uh, Hinduist countries. So the first incident was, uh, it came, I mean, the first incident was in Vietnam when a monk uh, self-immolated. But uh, starting from 1960s, uh, these uh, suicides started spreading in the Soviet bloc. And uh, there were some studies. Uh, one of the studies was by psychologist Kaminsky. He tried to um, analyze this phenomenon. So he said that these were political suicides, but they had very specific uh, characteristics. So he f identified several characteristics that distinguished these suicides from other suicides and why they can be considered to be political suicides. So they are very well thought through. They are meticulously prepared. Uh, people usually choose a symbolic location. For example, Rimanta Skalanta self-immolated uh, in the center of Konas in a symbolic place. And the protesters uh, try to spread information widely, that is, information about their motives. And Kaminsky also came to the conclusion that uh, many of the, these people come from families with uh, long um, traditions of dissident activity. And these political suicides are usually followed by other suicides. Um, um, by followers, and they are also usually um, followed by political repressions. And all, all of this uh, had a very significant impact on the general mood in Lithuania, and this led to an increased number of suicides. So these are um, some conclusions. Um, about the things that I mentioned. And now we come to 1968. So what happened in Lithuania and in some other Soviet uh, republics? So this period is significant. In one year, the number of suicides fell by a third. So that was the year when Perestroika began in the Soviet Union. So there were democratization processes, there was hope, and there was an anti-alcohol campaign. So this was, ref all of this was reflected in suicide rates, and uh, the rates went down. But when we speak about high or low suicide rates, for example, we had a presentation from Northern Ireland uh, just now, and I think that it would be interesting to look at some cultural comparisons. Well, every country has its uh, uh, history and uh, um, their own suicide rates. So you can see suicide rates uh, among males. So men reacted to social changes most severely. Well, uh, Lithuania s fought for its independence in 1989. We had uh, our Baltic Way when uh, uh, 2 or 2.5 million people held hands standing in a live chain of people of 650 kilometers. That um, human chain extended uh, throughout, the th throughout the Baltic uh, states. 
then the Soviet Union used military aggression against Lithuania and uh, the 13th of January 1991 was a very important day in Lithuania's history because um, Soviets uh, used military aggression against peaceful uh, protesters. And in 1991, in summer of 1991, Lithuania's independence was recognized. Lithuania started building its own state and <clears throat> suicide rates went up uh, significantly starting from 1992. That period was characterized by radical social, political, and economic reforms. People wanted to gain freedom, but many of them experienced what uh, uh, Polish sociologist Stomka called pains of transition. So people faced unemployment, they lost their social status, there was... Uh, uh, a lot of crime and corruption. So uh, suicide rates jumped by 82%. In 1996, Lithuania's suicide rate was the highest in the world. Uh, so it, it was uh, almost 47 suicides per 100,000 of population. So in suicide research, we uh, sometimes use the term the Hungarian period. That is the period when Hungary led the world in terms of uh, suicide rates. And then the Lithuanian period when Lithuania was the leader in this area. In um, 2005, um, for the first time in 10 years, uh, the suicide rate went below 40 per 100,000. In 2004, in, there were very important events for Lithuania. Um, Lithuania joined the European Union and NATO. Well, I, I'm calling the EU Europos Unia in Lithuanian. Well, we have a hist... Although the term in Lithuanian is different. Well, but we have a historian... We have a historian who thinks that we should use the word unia and not sayunga in Lithuanian. So that's why I use this term here. So that year was important to Lithuania. It brought about new hopes, new security guarantees. And starting from 2002, uh, suicide rates uh, went down by almost 50%. So if we use the concept of the social thermometer, we can say that uh, society's uh, mood or morals are improving. So what uh, conclusions can we draw from this history? Well, as I said, and as was said during this discussion, social, economic, and cultural context is very important if we want to understand the phenomenon of suicides. And as I said at the beginning, uh, well, those who work in this field know that there is a constant discussion and constant tensions between the broader approach and the narrow approach. And Lithuania's example shows that such large uh, decreases or increases in suicide rates cannot be explained by some narrowly defined factors. And we can't know every 
facts, uh, can't be aware of every fact uh, that uh, leads to the decrease or increase of uh, suicide rates. For example, in Switzerland or Sweden, suicide rates are rel- have been relatively stable for more than 100 years. So why do you have these dynamics in Lithuania? But this dynamics is observed in uh, the former Soviet republics, and uh, but not in the so-called Warsaw Pact countries. Well, you know that the Soviet bloc consisted of uh, 15 Soviet republics, but uh, also uh, part of uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Hungary, Poland, were not part of the Soviet Union, but uh, they were satellite countries which belonged to the so-called Warsaw Pact. Uh, And the dynamics of suicide is different. So in Hungary, in the Czech Republic, uh, with the start of perestroika, suicide rates went down. And there was no such drama in those countries as in Lithuania. So I believe that these figures reflect uh, the scope of trauma. It also shows that uh, people had to adapt to a completely new social and political situation and had to find their place in the world. So for some people, those changes were a breath of fresh air and they were able to use those changes. And we now have a free and uh, democratic and a wonderful country, but um, Building it required a lot of resources, moral resources, a lot of uh, knowledge and uh, economic resources that we didn't have. And that's why we had to pay this price. And um, um, there are people's lives behind this curve. And one more question. Why men? Why Lithuanian men? Because according to the latest statistics, Lithuania is still leading the world in the world according to the male suicide rates. So we might um, speculate and uh, there are different speculations and uh, health professionals and other intellectuals try to identify the reasons, but there is no objective research that would uh, help us to answer this question. And uh, we're now preparing some projects and we will try and uh, mm, reply to these questions. But I would be lying to you if I said that I could explain why um, suicide rates are so high among Lithuanian men. I believe that there are many explanations. And uh, um, the data will provide uh, some answers or will raise more questions. So this is what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the professor for this very interesting presentation. Uh, presentation rich in in data and um, insights. We will wait a couple of minutes um, for Siobhan to join us because, uh, well, interpretation is slightly lagging behind and Siobhan is still listening to the end of your presentation. So we'll use this time uh, for some Lithuanian questions. One of the participants is asking 
why there's no data on the period between 1940 to 1962. Why is this uh, gap? Well, that was uh, the historic reality. There were changes. Uh, one occupation followed um, was followed by another occupation, so data was not recorded, and there are no records. So simply no statistics from that period. Well, after the second. Uh, occupation after some time uh, passed after the second uh, presentation uh, um, statistics were collected uh, but it turned out that uh, uh, that statistical data was not reliable so the beginning of reliable Lithuanian statistics uh, is 1962. That's, that's great. Uh, and now we can have this 20 minutes of, of discussion. So I, I will have my, my own questions. But there are questions that participants wanted to ask you. And maybe there are questions or, or you know, reflections, comments that you want to uh, exchange which, uh, with uh, one another uh, while listening to these presentations. So I will start from, from my own. I, I think both of you made a very, mm, very uh, compelling point that these traumatic experiences can lead to increased suicidal behavior after these uh, traumatic uh, uh, periods of history are over and even could be uh, submitted uh, trans in, in, uh, uh, from one generation to, to another. On the other hand, when, when we have these kind of presentations, I uh, often uh, hear a lot of skepticism toward that. And somehow for people, uh, uh, not, not only general population, but for scientists as well is, is for some reason, mm, uh, hard to to accept this idea that that, that this that these conference, uh, consequences that this an impact is real. W what could you say about this? Do you want me to come in there? Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Okay. Um, so that was a wonderful presentation. That was really good. Thank you. Um, so. Yeah, I think once you, once you tell the stories and when you talk to the people who do the suicide prevention work in the community, they will tell you about this. They will, they will give you really, really strong examples of how an atrocity in a, you know, that a parent witnessed has impacted everything about that family. It, it leads to alcohol use. It leads to relationship breakup. Um, and even the... When we had our peace process, you, you know, a lot of groups in Northern Ireland felt that they hadn't achieved what they wanted to achieve. And that nearly made it worse for some people. It caused them to rethink what, you know, the purpose of the violence. And that had led to the alcohol use, the sadness, depression, mental illness. So it was nearly worse after the peace process here. I mean, I think that that's what you were saying as well. So um, we, I, th I think we need to speak to the people who are doing the work, who are working with, with the communities, and they will be able to give you the examples. Um, and even young people, when you talk to them and start really probing what, what has happened, what was their childhood like? what happened to their parents. Sometimes they don't know because parents don't talk about it. But once you open up this, you know, you, you just, it, it is actually revealed, but it's not the only reason. It's certainly not the only only reason. And we don't ever say that it is, but it is a huge factor. And, and then you look at the areas, the areas that have been most affected by the conflict and the legacy of poverty, lack of investment, unemployment, all of those things are factors too. And that's related to conflict and trauma. In, in a secondary way, you know, it's not it's not a direct, but it's still a, a relationship. Yes, I, I agree. It's not easier to to show how how it impacts, but we also have uh, 
as you say, just stories. I, I, I wanted to show one example, one case, but people can, can tell you a lot of stories. Uh, we have a very nice research um, led of our professor Grishina Gudaite in psychotherapy process. And this, um, this investigation of the process of long-term psychotherapy reveals also how deep it can be and how, how this transmission, transgeneral transmission happens. And also one more thing is what we here at Vilnius University did find, um, it's not only dangerous, I would say, not only dangerous to experience historical traumas, but psychologically is also very dangerous to adapt to regime and new new data in in our in our, in our research, also in, in the center of psychotraumatology and in suicidology, uh, show sometimes people who adapted very good to regime for many years, now we can see consequences, psychological consequences in families, in second generation. So it's very complicated, but, but yeah, we have we have um, data from different sources, from different points. It's 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 real. Okay, I I think especially and and we have this in questions here from participants that especially it's uh, it's difficult to grasp this transgenerational part. Because people say, okay, okay, the, the, there were people traumatized by troubles or by, by Soviet atrocities. So we, we get that. But but come on, the, the young generation that were born like decades or two after all this was over. And, and, and we see, uh, you know, um, high suicide rates or poor mental health, you know, just decades afterwards. So how, how, how come these young people who never experienced, uh, maybe sometimes even don't know about these atrocities, uh, how can they be affected? Affected? I don't know who, who wants to begin. Well, it is, it's, they're, they're not directly affected, but they're living in, um, in situations that are not, that, that are, adverse that that are harmful to them they've been harmed as a result of someone else's exposure they've been harmed as a result of what has happened to their families um, and to their communities and it's that harm that has led to the yeah but yeah. can you give maybe uh, some specific example what does it mean uh, adverse childhood experiences so so how how, how could it look like this adverse experience in childhood yeah, I, I can I can think of people who've been affected by this. Um, young people whose parents have neglected them, who've drank, who have young people who've um, been um, abused, physically abused in the home. There's a lot of physical punishment and violence in, in the homes where the, you know where parents have been ex affected by the troubles and parents have participated in in the conflict. So we we're thinking about young people who've been who've been harmed, who've been abused, and then who go on to take drugs. Um, and drugs is a, a big part of it in Northern Ireland. The communities where um, the troubles, the paramilitary groups have participated in the troubles that fought, were also dealing drugs and providing drugs in those communities. Um, so so the, you know, in the homes, if there was something wrong inside the house and children went outside, they, they were they had access to alcohol and, and particularly drugs, um, and that was very, very damaging to them. So poverty, drugs, neglect, abuse, violence, all of those things were much more common in households where people have been traumatized um, okay. and involved. 
in, in the violence? Yeah, so what you are saying, if, if, if people experience violence uh, and, and, and they are traumatized by this, so they may increase the alcohol con consumption or they have this PTSD symptoms and could be irritated, you know, and then and, and, uh, um, and, and, and w w when they are uh, raising their own children, they, they could be neglecting them or, or using physical violence because of their own condition and, and that these adverse experiences could lead to poor mental health afterwards that 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 really makes sense could could you Danuta, maybe add up, add something to this so i would say we can add also from from different or from broader perspective um, secrecy in the family uh, what uh, what narrative do family have and uh, our research shows those families who know, so the children of families who know the history of family, and as especially those who are happy with, proud with family history. Even so, they have repressed people in their family. They are more, how to say, more strong, more healthy, and especially now, because we won, because uh, these families, we are heroes, and you can be proud. But if you have a lot of secrecy, a lot of mm -hmm. unclear and unfair matters in your family, so as a young person, you just avoid to think about it, or family also is not interested no. to, to, to think, to, to talk about it. And so we have also this deep and silent process going through generations as well. I, uh, what I notice uh, when there is this, you know, discussion about the, the consequences of, of this traumatic experience is that one of the reaction is Probably also, I would call even uh, irritation that come on, uh, how long we can talk about this Soviet impact? Or I don't know if you experienced the same in, in Northern Ireland. Maybe someone is saying, come on, how, how, how uh, we should forget about troubles and move on. Uh, so th there is really this um, um, wish to just, just forget and, 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 and move on. Do you think it's a. Uh, it, do you think we should forget and, and would it be helpful or, or, or what is your take on that? We can't move on in Northern Ireland. This is still very current for us because we, um, the, the United Kingdom, have voted to leave Europe. Our peace agreement was based on the fact that both Ireland and the United Kingdom were part of Europe. And therefore, there was no need for a border and we could, you know, so so being part of the European community was an element of our peace process. Um, and now there's a lot, a lot of people who, who believe that 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 we need to re revisit that peace process from both sides. Um, and there's still a lot of conflict in Northern Ireland, um, albeit there's fewer people dying, but there's still a lot of conflict around what the future will be for Northern Ireland and what's the, you know, what, what would be the best. And there are conversations again about a United Ireland. We, we, we don't have people dying at the same level, but the, the discussions are very much there. Um, so we, we can't let, let this go. And there's issues around justice, around the truth about various different atrocities um, and families are still campaigning to, to have, um, to, to get information about what happened to loved ones. So all of those mechanisms that were agreed as part of our peace process, they haven't been dealt with. We haven't had that truth commission. We haven't had anything approaching that. So there are people who are seeking justice and truth um, and they believe that they would get that and that's what they voted for in the peace agreement and that hasn't happened. So we adults can't let it go. Young people are leaving in their droves. A third of our young people leave when they want to go to university. Um, because they don't want to stay here with all of the difficulties that we have, mm -hmm. you know, so that's an issue here too. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, it's, it's a very 
very difficult situation. On our mm -hmm. side, I would I would say we cannot forget, but we have to integrate uh, all these parts of history, all different points, areas. We have to integrate in in our in, how to say main narrative into our history and it's it's very very serious task for us we have to be able to discuss about it to discuss in the society in different groups different experiences but we have to go on i would say we are going on the process is going process of integration into into the main narrative of, of the society. So I would, I would see. Okay. Uh, one maybe more specific question to Siobhan. Uh, uh, the Nuta's presentation made clear that, that uh, these consequences of traumatic experiences affected more men than, than women. Do you see some some Mm -hmm. similar pattern in Northern Ireland, some some gender differences or? Yes, in terms of suicide, three quarters of our suicides are males. So certainly males are more much more likely to die by suicide and males were more um, impacted by, you know, in, in our study, we found that males were more likely to have a trauma associated with the, the conflict with the troubles. So that's certainly the case here. But when we look at rates of suicidal thoughts and self-harm, we find that women have more of those illnesses, those conditions. So with with suicide, yes, with mental illness, generally no yeah. um, it affects women and men. But the troubles, women tended to pick up the pieces. Men were fighting, you know, and most of the, the groups was the males were fighting and the women were at home, but they suffered as a result of it the same, you know? Yeah. Maybe you have questions to each other while listening to these presentations that you would like to ask. Can I ask, Dan, Dan is it, what what's the rate of suicide? I missed the start of your presentation. What's the current rate of suicide in, in Lithuania? What would be the... Uh, 27.3 you mean mm -hmm. current rate yeah 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 that that's so, it, it is yeah it's much higher northern ireland's was never that high um ours rose we felt that t during the time of the worst of the violence a lot of deaths weren't categorized as suicide because of the stigma and because we were a very religious country and still because the, the two groups are, are you know, it's like the religious, they're two religious groups. So religion is, is really powerful. So what, what's the role of religion in the Lithuanian suicides? Is, is, it, is there stigma around this from a religious perspective? Uh, no, not very much. I, I would say religion doesn't have strong protective factor power in Lithuania anymore because uh, very often religiosity is quite formal. If about 80% of population say they are religious, but in fact is about 10, I would say, so active. Uh, and due to other different factors, we cannot say in Lithuania religious religion has protective power, but in individual cases, what that I mentioned already, and everybody of us who works in psychotherapy, who who, who does uh, qualitative analysis, in individual cases you can see this pattern of of belonging to religious communities. Or, so. But not at, so to say, not at sociological level, not at epidemiological level. And what about you? Both sides in your country are religious, but I guess it's also religion as, as gun, 
as power or or is he also some authentic religiosity oh there is authentic religiosity here it's not as strong as it was previously um but the the church play a very powerful role here um the even our children would be educated separately because you know the catholic church have a separate education system and mm -hmm. so there there would still be high attendance at services for example it has declined um and you you know it's difficult to determine the actual religiosity and the authenticity yeah, of, course. of course but the majority of people in Northern Ireland would be able to identify as one community or the other, and those are Catholic or Protestant, you know. But we do have um, a, a rising uh, group of people who are who identify as not being religious, and you know the, the political parties would still be divided along those two lines, um, where Catholics would be nationalists and and Protestants would be unionists you know and the church the church would would have a, a very important role um in in community and, and would would often influence politics and, and there's been a huge row over um our decisions to close church services as part of our covid um restrictions mm -hmm. you know you can you can see there the backlash was huge and it was considered a really really serious thing to do you know when that happened and and it, this was you know and a lot of people were, were against that so yeah i i think I, I think that that's interesting i think that's an interesting barometer of it okay i i'm i'm sure we would continue even more yeah, and at least i would have some, <laughs> some questions and things to say but i just look at the at the watch and it's five o'clock already so we we have to stop here and big big thanks to both of you for for the wonderful presentations and reflections uh, uh, I, I'm not sure I can say that, but uh, what if she won? I, I, I would, because people were asking about this, about troubles. What what is that? And and, and, and you know, uh, if I referred people to watch uh, TV series Dairy Girls, what, what was it appropriate to learn a bit <laughs> about the history or not the the right? Uh, source. <laughs> Dairy Girls is a great program because it is said in my school at the time when I was at that school in um, 1994. So it's really about growing up whenever there was lots of violence in the British Army on the streets and the church um, had, you know, the, the nuns were doing the, the, the schools, they were running the schools. So it's great. Yeah, I, I would recommend that. We, you know, it's. <laughs> And it's hilarious. And it's hilarious. Yeah, they're in the background and some of the significant events like Bill Clinton mm -hmm. visits is in there and the Oma bomb, which I remember very well, you know, that's in that series. Yeah. Of and it's also really funny. You know, we have yeah, a great yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and it's also a, a serious point where I can say, and you know, knowing this Lithuanian situation that probably this, uh, you know, new generations can look more uh from from the distance of what was happening and 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 see the 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 traumatic part but also we have you know this distance and even you know ironically to to some things so i think dairy girls is a nice i would say a nice example of that mm -hmm. yeah. yeah but we have to stop here i i just will say a couple remarks uh closing remarks in lithuanian and and um for the participants, but but I thank you both and have a great weekend uh, ahead. Okay.